Hey folks, this is Rabble Rouse and Rich Bergeron. Ladies and gentlemen, the Tornado Tony Pentecost. Yeah, it's like a Tom Padgett with a brand new crystal ball. And, uh, All right, Tom, let's see how good your crystal ball is. Okay. <laughs> I got a big announcement. It's big, it's stupendous, it's cool. Awesome. I'm not pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> but, would you like to take a little danger of a guess? Uh, you're traveling somewhere. <laughs> wow, Tom's crystal ball is pretty, pretty good. Um, <laughs> it's going to be permanent travel, as I am packing everything up and moving to Peru. Uh, Why am uh, I moving to Peru, you said? Uh, I, I know what's a friend of mine sent me a message today, and I posted it on Facebook, that every December 25th, I won't get there in time this year, but a town in Peru celebrates Takanu Koi, or something like that. Men, women, and children settle grudges from the past year by calling each other out and having a fist fight. Then everybody goes drinking to numb the pain and move on to a new year. I've seen um, that on TV, actually. There's been me up. there's been some viral video on that. So yeah, least. I knew you wanted to travel. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so. sounds like a great holiday for me. But I, I thought that's hey, awesome. You know, I mean, the world will be a better place. You fight it out and you drink. That's why boxing so great. You know, ninety nine point whatever percent of the fights when it's over. Guys shake hands, they hug, you know, whatever, and then it's over. I mean, you don't have the rare times where, like, a guy like James Butler will sucker punch a guy after the fight, but when hmm. things happen at a post-fight press conference. But for the most part, the guys are like, you know what? It, we settled it, it's going. Yeah, it, it's like almost like a magic feeling. Like, no matter what was said before, hey, I had my chance, one way or the other. I mean, if you win, great, but if you lose, well, hey, I didn't lose an old punk. You know, no hard hmm. feelings. You know, you know, it's funny, Tom, you know, it's like, you know, obviously, you know, you watch <coughs> movies and things are scripted, but sometimes you watch a movie, there's a scene in a movie that really reflects how real life is, and um, it's funny because it popped up um, on, on YouTube the other day, this very scene, because it showed Stallone actually directing it, which was a scene from Rocky V, um, with a, a guy who went on to be a pretty big star, Kevin Connolly. And he was one of the bullies that was beating up uh, Rocky Jr. You know, when he first, you know, went back to the old neighborhood and all that. And then uh, finally, you know, the kid learned how to play a little bit, and he stood up to him and he punched him in the mouth a few times. And then the guy was like, "He said, you want to end it? Let's end it now." They shook hands, and later in the movie, they're hanging out on Christmas Eve, and you know, and they became friends. And sometimes that's how it works out. Like I had guys. In fact, the one guy messaged me a week ago. You know, wishing me a Merry Christmas. We went to school together, and this is this is a story long before my boxing days, but it's a great story about life. Um, we're in school, and I was kind of an awkward kid. You know, I was, I was in eighth grade, you know, and you're in that teenage years, and everybody's really awkward. And me and, and my friend, Mike, and I, who's still my good friend, Dominic's father, we were hanging out one day, okay, and, and Mike says, you know, these two guys, these two kids are, you know, talking bad about you. They're making fun of you. So I go over there, and I confront the kids, and, you know, nothing happens. We kind of push each other a little bit. But then the one kid, you know, was just being a smart-ass punk. So a couple weeks later, he and I met up at a park, um, and I hit him, and I, I, you know, knocked him down. He cried. I hit him in the stomach. And then, um, so what they were going to do is it was a bigger kid in that class, younger than me, but much bigger. So he was going to try to prove that I was, you know, a term for a cat, and I was a chicken. So he was going to call me out. He was going to say, I want to fight you. He's much bigger. And they were going, and I was going to back down and say no. And then they were going to tell me they were going to tell everybody I was a chicken. I was beating up the other kid, but I was afraid to fight him. So he comes up to me. and He goes, oh, "I'll call you out. I want to fight you tomorrow." I said, "Okay, what time?" He's like, "Oh, um, three o'clock after school." I said, "Okay, where? Whatever park." I said, "Okay, see you there." And we got there. Like neither of us wanted to fight each other, but in a way we kind of had to. He called me up, and I accepted it because I wasn't backing down, and we fought. And like I said, we were going tooth and nail. He was, like I said, much bigger than me. And at one point, he pushed me and I tripped. I was on the ground and he was hitting me. And I powered my way out of it and I fought back and I was bleeding. And my friend Michael tell the story better than anybody. He was like, the fight, 
a street fight lasted so long they had to break it up into rounds and give people like water breaks because it just kept going and going and going. And after it was over, we looked at each other, we shook hands. The next day, we were hanging out in school, and he's a great friend of mine to this day. But it all became down to a point, you know. Uh, sometimes somebody will test you, and if you stand up to them, you'll become their friend because they'll respect you. Right? Yeah, that actually happened and with and me and with, one with of my best friends. The fighters is even more. In uh, college? Know? I mean, they, they respect the training you have. Without the fight fight. Go through how yeah. hard it is. I had a friend in college, um, he used to push people's buttons like an artist almost. Yeah, it turns out he was, he was an alcoholic, so that probably fueled it, but he would just grind at you and grind at you until you like exploded on him, you know? But if you didn't, you didn't explode on him and, and you ignored him, he wouldn't give you the time of day. He would, he would just keep chipping away, chipping away, and once you exploded on him, you know, all right, you're my friend. <laughs> it was crazy. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was just like, it took so much, though, from this kid to get me to break. And I about threw him off the side of a hill one day when he said something. I forget even now but what it was, but, man, it was just like, all right, it's on. <clears throat> uh, but he yeah. was like that. Like, you he, he had to, like, go back and forth with him a little and show your toughness, even though he would never fight you. Like, and... and uh, right. We had an incident when we got our rings, this big ceremony, junior junior ring night. and <laughs> So we were both drinking, but he was drinking more heavily. And he, there was also a hot tub involved at this condo. It was like a ski lodge condo. So he was drinking hard liquor and sitting in a hot tub all night. And uh, I had to bring him back to his room on campus. <clears throat> and it, I'm driving his rental car, and I had only been drinking like beer and stuff, you know, and not much at all. So I'm driving his rig, and uh, it's a rental car, and it's his girlfriend comes all the way up to, from Virginia to Vermont for this event, you know. And uh, he doesn't want to get out of the car when I get to his room. So I open the door, and uh, he, he starts being a pain in the ass, like he won't get out. So I finally get him to come out, and then he, he walks around the other side of the car and gets back in. So at this point, I'm fucking rip shit, you know, because I just want to get back to my room and go to sleep, you know. But <laughs> he's just being drunk and crazy, so he's just, I ended up going in after him to try to drag him out, and he reached out and grabbed my ball sack and twisted. And he always used to say that was what he was going to do in a fight. Always. That's the first move he was going to do. Like, so I should have known. But, of course, worst pain in my life and my first instinct is to start punching him in the head with my giant ring on my hand that <laughs> I just got from the school. Uh, so he punches me a couple times, I punch him, and it turned out I had like a little 2000, because it was the year 2000 I went through with, even though I graduated in 1999, I went through the freshman system with the year 2000. So I had like a 2,000 imprinted in a little tiny cut, but he woke up the next day with blood all over his pillow, and it, it was a bad one. But uh, we were still best of friends the next day. Like, we, we laughed it off. I mean, I you didn't. know, that, that would be a good one to have a film of. I, I'd have loved to see a camera of that one in the car. That would be on one of those. Uh, it's going to be. It's going to be when I write my novel about the school. You get at three in the morning. Well, when my dog wakes me up and he has to go out and I can't go to sleep, so I start channel surfing and most shocking, wild, oh, you know, that's how you stop. That would have been a good one. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a damn miracle, though. We didn't really cut each other up with those damn rings. I mean, first night we we got them on and we were tooling each other up with them. And that was one of the things, like, back in Norwich's, like, meaner days that the cadets were known for, like going into bars and fighting people with their brass knuckle <laughs> rings. You know? So, yeah, it could be dangerous. When um, when we were um, at the Chaz Palminteri show a few months ago, and we stopped over, that was down in the town where I grew up, and we stopped over at the one bar, and I'm there like, with my friend Mike and his wife and a few other you know friends and you know, family and all that, and 
I was telling a story. I said, man, this bar has been renovated, but back in the day, you know, it was, you know, just a side of the wall, side of the road bar, but it was a good hangout because a lot of the local guys that all lived here would go there a lot. And I said, the one night we were there, Thanksgiving Eve, and just chilling out, and two guys I knew got into a fight, and the first punch, because they were bigger than me, and the one guy had me screamed. I couldn't see. And uh, when the guy opposing him threw a punch, and he stepped out of the way, I never saw it coming. He hit me right in the face. And he had a ring on it and it cut me open in the chin. And I said, the fists were flying. And I said, I was like, I stepped right out. I was like, you know, and I, and I said something to the guy. And I stepped out. And I said, when the cop came, he wanted to interview me because I got blood on me. And I said, look, I was still fighting at the time. And I said, look, I get punched in the face 364 days a year. tonight, my night off. You know, I really didn't feel like getting hit tonight. And then the bartender, who was my friend that I, I saw again just a few months ago, he said to the, to the police officer goes no he got sucker punched and did not retaliate you know i was like these guys are bigger than me i would have dropped both of them yeah it's crazy anyway we got some fights to talk about um and here's something i stumbled across the other day yesterday i think it was well perusing netflix's options there's a movie called This Is The Night. Have you heard of this, Tony? This Is The Night. Yeah. Okay, here's the synopsis. After watching Rocky Three on its opening day in 1982, the members of a Staten Island family come away inspired to face their various problems head on. <laughs> uh, the cast includes Naomi Watts, Big name. Frank Grillo, Bobby Cannavale, uh, Lucius Hoyos, Madeline Klein, and Jonathan Howard King. And uh, they say they're putting it in the genres of comedies, dramas, and independent movies. But there's actually a movie about a family inspired by Rocky Three now. So, a movie about family watching a movie. Ah, it's weird. Some strange times with it. <clears throat> but, uh, you think Rocky Three was that memorable, Tony? Were you there on opening day in 1982? <laughs> I was six years old, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen it. I haven't actually watched it. But, uh, it was made in 2021. It's just one of the oddest subjects for a movie I have ever heard of. But there it is. Movies inspiring movies. Anyway. I'll tell you, you know, on the, um, on the box in front, but, um, you know, real life. Uh, last week I was, well, I was supposed to originally go to this event uh, down in Glenside, where I grew up, Glenside, PA, right outside of Philly. Um, and then I got, I was given box tickets to Sunday's Eagles game. All right, yeah, I'm getting box seats, baby. Oh, the game's being postponed until Tuesday because of COVID. That's been fucking fantastic. Hmm. Guess I'm going back to this event in Glenside. Well, there's a book that just came out, and it's basically like, a, a, it's like, um, it's more like has like photos and like blurbs about the history of boxing in Atlantic City. And... So the one guy that wrote it, his name is John DeSanto, and, and he does a lot for Philadelphia boxing history. And then there's another guy, Matthew Ward. So they were doing a book signing down in Glenside about 200 yards from where I grew up at my cousin's bar. I said, shit, I'm, I'm going to go to this. So I went down there and uh, hung out with those guys for a while. And I'll tell you, man, they had a number of former guests of our show in that book, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so... And, and I was just small talking with these guys. You know, we were talking about different fights. You know, they had Arturo Gotti on the cover. Um, we were talking about Gotti. I sent the one guy the article that I wrote after Gotti passed away. Um, and, and we were just talking about different fighters back in the day and current fighters. And the one guy looked at me and he goes, what do you think of Tyson Fury? And we started talking about, you know, Tyson Fury. And I was talking about how I know Sonny Kato, who had trained with him a few times. And I said, I'll tell you the honest thing, I said, back in the day, I did not like Tyson Fury. I, 
I did not like him at all. You know, I thought he was brash. And the fight that really kind of turned me off, like, I didn't like him for a while, but he was more like a casual dislike. Um, but a fight that I really didn't like him over was um, the fight with Vladimir Klitschko. Because Fury did little and benefited by Klitschko doing less. It was a horrible fight. You know, Fury moved, jabbed, Klitschko did nothing. Um, and I said, and I remember saying it in the fight, and I said it on the air. When you have King Kong and Godzilla, and they waltz for a 12 round, I said, that's not what you pay to see. You know, you pay to see King Kong and Godzilla tear down buildings. And I said, I was really disappointed. And then, you know, Fury came back, who cares, right? And the guy, one guy I was talking to, Matthew Ward, said the, he was saying the exact same thing. And I said, but I'm a fan now. I said, I really like that Fury. So do I. And we both pointed out the moment when we became Tyson Fury fans, and it was the exact same moment. <laughs> 12th round, Deontay Wilder, when he got up. <laughs> and he had no business getting up from that right hand left hook combo. No business. You're adrenaline. Getting up from it at all. And then not only did he hang on, he brought the fight right to Wilder. And he basically said, everything I've been through with the mental health and all that, this was, getting up was nothing. You know, fighting back was nothing. Because I've been fighting back my whole life. And then when he advocated so much that he was doing for people that were were struggling with, with mental health and all that and donating a lot of his money. All of his this money. Guy Matthew Ward and I said this all thing. of his he purse from money. Not liking him. To becoming fans, yeah, exactly. All the first money. Um, so I'm going to work on getting these guys on the show for us. But um, I'm guaranteeing that he he must have some side deals <laughs> to make that possible. Um, he didn't make nothing for that fight. Like, <clears throat> there's got to be like some. Well, there's obviously pay per view deals, um, but still impressive nonetheless to give up your whole purse. Um, I think the first fight he gave him to give it to the homeless, and then the second fight he said he yeah. was going to give up the purse too. Uh, maybe this time it was to mental health people, but yeah, incredible stuff. Anyway, um, we don't have to talk about heavyweights much, but uh, as far as boxing goes, we're going to save the MMA for last because we might not be able to talk much about it in the next few weeks. We're not going to have a, a single big MMA event until January 15th. Stop celebrating, Tony. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we had some fights last week. Uh, the biggest one I'd love to talk about, I didn't see much of it, but I did see the bits and pieces. Artur Baturbiev got a little cut on his forehead, but uh, ended up mowing down Marcus Brown. At uh, an opportune time and uh, securing his um, unbelievable record there. Just setting him up and knocking him down. All knockouts. Yeah. yeah, that was You got to give Marcus credit. He came to fight. Yeah. And I had him doing real good early, but that was uh, Arturo's MO. And I remember the referee, or the doctor came in after that cut. I mean, uh, Arturo had a, um, well, how do you? describe it diplomatically on his forehead. And the doctor said, we're going to give it one more round. So Arturo really had to step it up. And <laughs> that and sounds like a little familiar Rocky Marciano he, he incident the, we know of, Tony. Yeah. What he knows. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 he, and he just was, it was just very, um, like, a, just walked him down. It was just inevitable. Marcus, I think, it dropped in the seventh round. But uh, he showed a lot of credit. Kept trying. Kept trying. Yeah. Give him credit for that. But he just couldn't stop him. And those body it, again, just a wonderful finish. I mean, the way he mixed his body shots up with the head shots, and good for him. So uh, there was rumors that Canelo was rethinking going to cruiserweight and wanted to see how Arturo would look for this fight. Well, I think Canelo's going to go to cruiserweight. Mm-hmm. I hope he doesn't. But yeah. That, be a great fight. He's got to eat a lot of those Mexican cows <laughs> with the <laughs> illegal stuff in them. He's got to take a year off from boxing to bulk up, and then he's going to go over to the regular meat. <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, Arthur, yeah. Arthur is... He is a strange bird sometimes. Like, uh, He's one of those guys who not only makes good adjustments, but kind of on the detriment side of it, it, it takes a little bit of, uh, of, you know, getting knocked around to really get pissed enough to knock people out. I think... I think he goes into fights thinking, you know, I, I really like to be the tactician this time. And he tries to be too smart, and he gets himself in trouble. And when he gets in trouble, he's like, oh, knockout mode. <laughs> and this fight was a perfect example of that. You know, as he gets up to steeper competition, he doesn't have that much experience. So these little weaknesses from that lack of experience it kind of force his killer instinct out of him. And that's what happened the other night. And it's just a brilliant setup to the to the final knockout. He just unloaded. <laughs> and uh, that's I didn't I didn't hear about um, you know the referee saying he was going to stop it. So that's interesting because it just brings right back the, the whole Rocky Marciano thing we've been stuck on. Well, for a few it wasn't days. the ref. It was the do- it, it wasn't it was the, the ref. Yeah, it was the, the doctor. doctor. Yeah. Right, and the doctor didn't say he was going to stop it, but he said. I'm going to give, we'll give him more round to see how it goes. And, uh, and our former guest, Dyson, he was really pumping him up in the corner. He did a great job. Oh, he's and actually on, on TV? Like, even though it had to be translated. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, ESPN Plus. Ah, ah. Yeah, that's how I caught it. And um, uh, I, this man, John Scully, did a great job also. It's a little awkward because everything has to be translated. But yeah. It worked. John's been doing some great things for uh, some of the fighters, too, outside of uh, the stuff he's been doing with Baturbiev and, and active fighters. He's really been uh, helping out. Uh, Donald Curry is the latest latest guy. Um, but, like, retired yeah, guys in dire straits or, you know, paralyzed fighters. And, you know, I saw the thing about um, Curry, and I thought to myself, geez, you know, Whatever happened to the pay the fighters movement, you know? Even in the UFC, it's kind of died out, you know? And, and um, like I've always said, I, I, I think Conor McGregor's a schmuck for not trying to fight for that issue and, and just, you know, making money himself. And he hasn't gone through nearly the blood, sweat, and tears that some of the guys on the UFC roster for 10 years have gone through. You know, I, I, you just could fill a book with all the issues that they faced and they're going to face after they retire because the UFC has pretty much taken all their opportunities away to make extra money as long as they're associated with the UFC. And, you know, especially with all these breakout things going on, you know, freaking triad combat, rear knuckle boxing, and, these, and, and the UFC is able to, like, suck onto these people and make them fight this one, like, big black last blockbuster fight, you know, on their contract, and they do all this crazy stuff, and lifetime rights, and <clears throat> it's just nuts, but anyway, the point is, uh, you know, I have registered the website, paythefighters.com, and um, it's either going to be a blog about the subject, or a way to sell my book on the subject. Because I've collected a lot of notes over the years since we've been doing the show on that whole issue. And I think it needs to be, like, put into a book. And then, ultimately, it ought to be a website where people are able to contribute, like, tipping a waitress or a waiter, you know. You should be able to say, oh, that was a great fight I saw the other night. I want to give that guy some money. You know, especially the gambling getting legalized everywhere. You know, if you're, say you're a guy that just won a big bet off a fighter, you want to be able to contribute directly to that fighter if you possibly can, right? And everybody's got all these little pay apps, Venmo and PayPal. It's time that there's an interface for people to be able to say, hey, listen, I want to tip that guy. (laughs) He just just had the fight of his life, you know? If that's legal to do, we can figure it out. I want to create that interface someday. <coughs> Paythefighters.com. I thought that would be hard to get, too, but I got it. So anyway, I'd love to get John involved in something like that. And 
uh, we're due to have him back on the show. It's been a few years. <coughs> but uh, he's done great with Perturbiev and uh, one of his other boys. How about this for a transition? One of his uh, other fighters that he was very famous for helping shape into the big bad Chad that he became. Chad Dawson is uh, making the news. He's going to fight Vitor Belfort at Triad Combat 2 in February. I don't know what to think about that. <laughs> uh, I don't know how active uh, he has been. I'm talking about um, uh, no, Vitor. We've seen Vitor has been active there, but Chad Dawson last fight is, um, it says here, this is a from Sure Dog, so it pretty much it's just talking about Belfort, I guess, but, okay, so. Well, that, you know, that, so that sounds like an intriguing matchup, and, uh, uh, Rich, gotta try to get, uh, Sean back on the show again. Yeah. Sean Wheelock. Definitely. Um, I'm sure I have his contact information still from that first interview. And I'm sure he's like, he's, cause since he's in media, he doesn't get a lot of opportunities to do interviews. But one thing I would love to find out is how much Mountain Dew pays him. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get some of that Mountain Dew money? <laughs> I'll pretend to drink that shit. <laughs> uh, every picture Tony this guy has on social media, he's got a giant thing of Mountain Dew in the picture. Julie. It's funny. Anyway, um, Dawson actually has, according to this, fought seven times since 2014, most recently going 2-0 in 2019. So, we'll see. Triad Combat is an interesting concept. They can get through all the lawsuits. I like that first show. I think they could have done a little bit of better matchmaking in a couple of the bouts, namely the main event and the female fight, but, uh, you know, hopefully they'll iron all those details out as they go along. But overall, I like the concept. You know, smaller surface forces you to fight, less corners, and a little bit of a modified glove and modified rules. It's like a street fight with rules. I mean, <laughs> no takedowns. No takedowns. So. Guaranteed fight on the feet. It's an interesting hybrid, that's damn sure. Uh, but anyway, Victor Belfort versus Chad Dawson. Place your bets. Okay, so. We also have a story here about Cub Swanson. He is thinking about a late career move to Bantamweight. Uh, he knows he can make it. I don't know how difficult it would be, he said. This is one of the easier career cuts I've had. Easier cuts I've had. I just feel like I'm naturally a little lighter than I used to be. I guess I'm not just not holding on muscle like I was before. That's a possibility. He's had 21 fights. It would like a title, but uh, he's gonna get there. He uh, performed pretty well the other night. Um, sometimes he's hit or miss, and uh, again, the uh, the fighter I thought was gonna win the main event um, did not. <laughs> Derek Lewis is sometimes hit or miss, and uh, the last time I bet him bet on him heavily, thinking he was gonna pull off the knockout, he, he didn't. This time, of course, Chris Daukas, young up-and-comer, not much experience, waded into deep water and got dispatched pretty easily there in the, start, in the first round there. Three minutes and 36 seconds in, and I had Derek on one card, and thankfully, the other favorite that I had on all my lineups, I think I, I had three of them, uh, one of them won, won double the money, 
which is like $18. <coughs> no big money winners, but uh, that one had, uh, what is it? Uh, I didn't uh, win the fight by knockout, but I had him in the MVP slot. Second fight of the night, Dante Mays and Josh Parisian, okay? I did my MMA Rain Man on that, Tony, and uh, <laughs> the computer came out with Parisian. It looked like he was going to win that one. And, uh, you know, of course, I hedged my bets with one card, and I, I had uh, Dante Mays in the, in the main MVP. He did get the TKO, actually, from elbows in the third round. <laughs> I ended up losing the feet for a minute in the third round. So I didn't see the ending, but I could kind of see the writing on the wall the first two rounds. But uh, Parisian just was a fish out of water. Amaze, Josh dominated and you know, overtook him in the third round, obviously. But I also happened to get Jordan Levitt right. On, on, I had him on two, two of the different cards, I think. Uh, or one card, and the other sales guy on the other one. And then uh, Melissa Gatto was the one to have. She got a TKO in late in the fight, body kick and punches, 45 seconds into the third round. I did pick Charles Jordan Wright over Andre Ewell. Uh, Raquel Pennington was a big one I missed. I had Macy on my losing cards. And she lost by a guillotine choke in the second round, three minutes and seven seconds in. And Raquel looked better than ever. Really sharp and you know, totally outclass Jason. Uh, and the big one, it was uh, sort of a 50 50, even though Harry Hunsucker has been knocked out 100% of the time he has appeared in a UFC fight. I knew that, I did that analysis going in, but I still picked him on the card that didn't win the big box, but it, uh, it doubled my money. So uh, he, he was like my lowest scoring guy there. But Justin Taffa I had on the other ones. I, I had a feeling he was going to win. And uh, he went with all my favorites. Not some of the favorites I picked lost. Uh, Gerald Mearshart also got a rear naked choke submission. And uh, I thought that was going to be a decision. Dustin Stoltz was, was a pretty tough tough dude. But uh, just couldn't, couldn't hang with Mearshart. And he is on a roll. Cub Swanson and Darren Elkins, I also thought that was going to be a war, that was going to go to decision, but of course, Cub pulled off uh, a spinning wheel kick from across the cage, really, and it just had uh, Darren Elkins uh, walking sideways for a couple seconds, and then the punches, and okay, went to the ground, it was over, and whoosh, Elkins, for the reputation that guy has to go out that quickly, that's some special stuff from Cub Swanson that's stepping it up. Uh, and so he's obviously, you know, trying to show people that he's still 100% in it to win it. And, uh, man, that was a great performance on his part. I wish I could have seen that coming, but I just, I, I just had war in my head. I thought that was going to be, you know, fight of the night for the fact that it was going to be bloody and crazy. But I guess... Maybe that's what made Cub Swanson react that way and try to win it so quickly because he didn't want that. <laughs> but yeah, it was more just the placement of the kick. It's just brilliantly placed. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, yeah, like you said, ten. when he's when he's on, he's on. Yep. And he was on for sure. Yeah. So that was a great one. Uh, Gamrock, I knew that one was going to be a TKO. Took him a little bit longer than I thought. But uh, he took out Diego Ferreira uh, by submission from a knee to the body. Ouch. Broke a rib, probably. Uh, that was in the second round, three minutes and 26 seconds in there. And then Ricky Simon was the big one I missed. That was the second round knockout of uh, Rafael Asensio. Uh I thought that was going to go to decision. So that was my analysis, but, you know. Sometimes you gotta 
you gotta go. All right, I picked all these fights. I think this is gonna happen. I gotta, I gotta bet the opposite, like all the way. So sometimes you really gotta hedge your bets in that way. Amanda Lemos also was big money favorite. Everybody knew she was gonna win, but I thought she was gonna win by knockout, and she won by split decision, which is not much points. Uh, Bilal Mohammed, I had a really good feeling on him. Uh, he was on my winning lineup, but again, it was a unanimous decision, not a KO, so I didn't end up with the big money, big money because of you know, little stuff like that. But uh, yeah, Derek Lewis would have been nice to have in the MVP slot instead of, you know, just on the regular lineup too. He got to win in quick fashion. And then uh, some other fights I didn't have picked. Uh, So that was UFC Fight Night 199, and uh, it's going to be a long time before the next one, January 15th, and then we have to wait for January 29th for Bellator, but uh, we're going to be having uh, Calvin Qatar versus Chikadze on uh, January 15th, and uh, boy, that is going to be a dicey one. Uh, Chikadze is just so brutally, uh, just sharp, just, as he has the confidence of uh, a young, um, what's the guy I'm thinking of, um, uh, the praying mantis guy, Tony, boxer. Oh, okay. Victor Chinian. Victor Chinian. Remember when Vic was just knocking people out left and right and working with Tyson for a little while? That's, that's who yeah, Chikazi. he beautifully balanced the meat with the air. That's, that's how Chikazi comes across as an MMA fighter. And Calvin Qatar is like uh, just a journeyman, really, a long time fighter. Um, he's kind of in the middle of his UFC stint. But he just had a really, really tough fight with Max Holloway not too long ago. This totally destroyed him. <coughs> uh, it was a miracle he lasted the distance. Or he got knocked out in the last round, I think. I don't know. It was, it was a crazy fight. It took a lot of damage. So for them to throw him to the wolf again, uh, I don't know if he wanted this fight, but uh, God love the guy for stepping up. But man, I feel, I feel like this is do or, do or die, you know. He's got to really put on a show and, and do something big and stop this guy in his tracks to... Uh, further up the ladder in his career and he's main eventing again so <clears throat> big opportunity for him to do that he's from the Boston area I'll so I'll be that, pulling that. for him but uh, wow that is a tall task for him uh, Giga Chikadze he's only 14 and 2 but man, he is just precision knockout artist <clears throat> and uh, it's just surprising power for that league be something, something to watch as he uh, goes further in his career, but, you know, who knows? Maybe Calvin knows his kryptonite. So, we got to go to Christmas Day. What do you think? We got any boxing matches on Christmas Day? I know the day after Christmas is Boxing Day, but uh, who's fighting on Christmas? Except the kids over which present to open first. <laughs> okay, we actually do have a big card on Christmas Day. On Fox TV, believe it or not, from Newark, New Jersey. And main eventing is a surprising young man named uh, Vito Milnicki Jr. 9 and 1 at Welterweight. Fighting Nicholas Delomba, who is 16 and 3. So a little bit more experience. Each of them have lost one of their last six. And uh, yeah, Vito is a uh, tough little, tough little guy. We've been following his career pretty much since it began. Well, yeah, since his amateur days on our site, and uh, he's been uh, affiliated with some some people that send us regular press releases. 
So this is big for him to main event. Also on the same card, we have uh, Kenneth Sims Jr. at super lightweight, 16, 2, and 1. Fighting Kareem Martin, who's 14, 2, and 1. And then Joey Spencer, 13, and 0. Fighting Limberth Ponce, 18, and 4. Oh, that was a weird first name. Limber with a TH at the end. <laughs> Middleweights as well, uh, 7-0 Peter Kamukov fighting Derek Coleman Jr. Oh, Jr. is on this card. Coleman Jr. is 13-1. Heavyweights too, Norman Neely, who is 10-0, fighting Alan Melson, 6-3. And, and we got a somebody who's always got to go fight on this one. Sean Williams at welterweight 8 0 and 1 fighting Anthony Velasquez who's undefeated at 10 and 0 with no draws. And Clay Collard is also on the card. 9 5 and 3 fighting Yo Elvis. Not Elvis. Yo Elvis Gomez. <laughs> 4 and 0 is his record. And guess what? have a Jesus fight on this very same card. And he's undefeated Jesus. And he's, uh, he must be a techni technically uh, proficient guy because his first name is Elon. Elon de Jesus. He is 3-0-1. And, and how about this? Fighting Michael Angeletti. <laughs> it's 4-0 at Super Bantamweight. Uh, only on Christmas Day. Jesus is fighting an angel. <laughs> no, that's, I, I, I crossed it. I crossed signals, that's wrong. I take that back. Michael Angeletti is also super bantamweight, but he's fighting in the next card. Next fight on the card. Elon de Jesus is fighting Ray John Chance, who is 5 0 and 1. So we have a chance against Jesus. Uh, anyway, welterweights as well. This one's worth mentioning. The guy's got a pretty chunky record here on one side. Anyway, Michael Anderson, 21-3-1, fighting no Alejandro Lopez. 10-4-1 at welterweight there. It's all from New Jersey. we got a title fight in Ghana. Super featherweight, Joshua Olawasuin Wahab, 21-0. Fighting Jackson Malingingi, who is 11-4-1 for the WBO Africa Super Featherweight title. <coughs> well, there it is. That's your whole schedule. Biggest fights of the weekend. We didn't even have to search for a Jesus fight. Do you believe it's pretty much... I had lined up for previews and stuff, but I got a couple other stories. I, know I set aside here. Um, how about that? Uh, those uh, lawmakers getting carjacked, huh? <laughs> I saw that. saw that email from Tom earlier. It's getting pretty bad out there. Yeah, and and I just found out it happened in Chicago, a suburb of Chicago also, with um, the Chicago uh, Senate Majority Leader. Oh, yeah. Uh, at the state level, Democrat. That. So, uh, yeah, it happened to her, too. That's not a part of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. So the craziest part to me is these guys were doing the smash and grabs. They go and they bust into a Home Depot in big groups and they steal their sledgehammers from Home Depot and then they go to the stores and smash up store windows with stolen sledgehammers. 
I mean, talk about a lack of worth at work ethic, you know. At least go get a job so you can afford to buy the sledgehammer. <laughs> Unreal. Unreal. It's just ridiculous. I mean, it was like, you know, we were all kind of saying it, even though, you know, a lot of people were up in arms about, you know, whether they could tolerate Trump. The, the, the point was, you know, the lesser of two evils in that situation was going to be Trump as far as what what the guy was going to do to the country going forward. You know, Trump was going to shore it up economically. He was going to work on trade. And, you know, he was going to keep doing some of the same things he was doing. His policies were great. They were working. And Biden was going to spend, spend, spend. And, you know, put us in debt and cause inflation. You know, like, it couldn't... I mean, even though you don't want the country to get destroyed to prove yourself right, it's like... It, this guy could not be destroying the country more. <laughs> at this point. In the democratic way, on top of it. Like, you know, all these people that are super progressives, they're calling them. You know, they want everything for free. You know, college debt wiped out. And, and they want to defund the police. And... And they, they're talking about, oh, we need to put more stuff into psychologists' hands. Well, guess what? There's a big, huge shortage in this country of psychologists who want to work with criminals. Because it's no fun and it's not enough pay. <laughs> so good luck. Good luck getting, the, getting those people. It's ridiculous, I mean. Well, you want to hear something very ironic? in the Philadelphia area. So, oh, Philly is one of the, big, the worst, is, right? Philadelphia is one of the absolute worst. And then we have a very progressive mayor who's a jackass. Our DA, who got elected in a landslide, is one of those guys, they call him let him loose He's <laughs> all about, you know, no cash bail. Oh, and that's like that. the and worst. On the street, and a week no later, consequences. You know, like, oh, the blue. Like, this hit. Hey, there was a murder out there, and think you know, Philadelphia got like you know, almost six hundred murders right now. Like, there was a murder out there. Oh, the guy had a rap sheet this long and was just released a week ago. You know. Yeah. So yes, yesterday, right there, where I, you know, right across the street from where all the Philadelphia sports complexes are, Eagles, Phillies, and all that. There's a big field there, and that's where I used to do a lot of tailgating when I go to the games. Um, a congresswoman was carjacked there yesterday. A Democratic congresswoman. Democratic Congresswoman who's big into defunding the police, Congresswoman. A Democratic Congresswoman big into defunding the police who is also uh, either married to or dating the Philadelphia very progressive DA. Hmm. <laughs> oh boy, I didn't know that. Jeez. <laughs> Mary Gay Scanling, her name or something like that is. Look it up, it's all over the news. But see, here's the funny thing because they carjacked her. And she had, um, like, her work laptop in there. They consider that basically a federal crime because it was, you know, um, you know, uh, I guess, what do you call, I don't want to say political, but you, you know what I mean, um, secure, like, um, duh, you know, the computer and all that, which was is basically owned by the U.S. government. So there's no chance of letting this Larry letting this guy lose. Which, why, what do you, basically, his own woman just got, you know, held up at gunpoint. Um, but now it's going to be a, basically a federal crime. <laughs> because uh -huh. he had, you know, secure, uh, secure documents. Oh, yeah, it gets worse and worse every day, it's crazy. And then, they, you know, on top of it, you got all these shortages. I, I went by the gas station at the end of the block today near my house and uh, no gas says on all the, all the gas pumps so I don't know what that is, that's all about but uh, that's the first time I've encountered that uh, it's, it's just crazy uh, situation they that the Democratic Party pretty much well, like, like, across the board is put like, us in like Washington Post said we have to get used we have to get used to a lower standard of living deal with it <laughs> you see how that goes, you know, in the terms, and that's presidential election. It's a very positive message. Just right. get used to a lower standard of living. It's what you deserve.
Thank you, brother. Oh, by the way, Tony, before I forget, I watched your oh, Eagles I... the other night. And uh, first of all, i got to say, I've never seen a rarer interception off the back of uh, the foot there, Goddard there. Yeah. He made uh -huh. me some money having him in my lineups the other night for that game. Uh, but uh, the best part was when somebody in the audience... During one of the reviews, they were reviewing a play, and the ref comes back to make his announcement, and he was taking forever to activate the mic. And somebody from the, you know, the stands yells out as loud as possible, "Upon further review, you suck." <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was great. Uh, anyway, so yeah. That was a good game to watch. Nice comeback. Yeah, I didn't have everybody right. Yeah, uh, I was doing a, uh, I was doing a gig that night, so I missed like the first, well, half of the first quarter basically. I missed. It. So it was, but I had just gotten in my car, and I flipped on the e Eagles radio broadcast, and um, so I hear the announce like the Eagles announcer since probably before I was born, and. Uh, he was like, and uh, the uh, spotted kick up and good. I'm like, well, when he makes a, a kick announcement like that, whether it's a fear or like, and the extra point is good. I'm like, well, I know it's a touchdown just happened. And when he says it like in that like pissed off tone, I'm like, and I know it's another team, the other team's touchdown. And um, and then that he came out and said, was, wow, that was a bad interception. And then he was like, um, you know, yeah, the other team's winning seven nothing. And then I'm driving home, and the Eagles are driving. They get sacked, fumble the ball. Shit, god damn it. And then, um, it's 10 nothing. Now it's 10 nothing. Next thing you know, it's 27 17 at the end of the game. So I'm like, in my mind, it's 27 7 because I missed those first 10 points they gave up. So I, I you know, credit myself for that victory. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Fuck around. I'm sorry, I, you know, as I was saying, a lot of our previous weeks, my fantasy team has been killing it all year. Been killing it. Had a bye last week. Still had the most points out of everybody. The two teams in the playoffs, all the teams in the constellation, highest points. I'm rocking and rolling. I'm ready for the semifinals right now. I got two players on COVID and another one out for three weeks. Huh. Are you fucking kidding me? I went injury free the whole year. We finally get to the playoffs. Two players on COVID. Two of my top players on COVID, and one of my starting running backs is um, on on out for three weeks. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? And now I'm projected. I'm an underdog this week. And they're all vaccinated, so, right? All the NFL yeah. players are supposed to be vaccinated. Well, hopefully, hopefully by two. Well, I think they're supposed to be like ninety percent or something. But what I'm hoping is, is two COVID guys uh, because they they tested on Tuesday can um, be cleared to play by Sunday. Right. So, then, then I'm... Yeah, it's a crazy world. Then I'm, then I'm back in the game. I, I'm I'm sitting here thinking, even further down the line, what are they going to do with the Olympics? Already the NHL players have pulled out. The Olympics are going right. to collapse, and it couldn't happen to better people than China. <laughs> with what they pulled with yeah, the right, fucking right, right, coronavirus right, right. in the first place. <clears throat> but, you know, if this keeps up, it makes no sense for anybody to even want to travel that far, never mind, you know, compete with a bunch of people. And then there's going to be nobody in the stands. There's going to be no tourism. I mean, it's not even worth doing it. <clears throat> uh, you know, especially to glorify a country like that that's pulling so many, right. uh, you know, human human rights abuses. <clears throat> Freaking. You know, you know, it's, it's, um, you, you know, it's like crazy. It's like I, I, I've learned to ask questions. You know, I don't ask questions to be, you know, a, a troublemaker. I ask questions because, you know, I believe in accountability. I believe in, um, you know, transparency. Right. So, the same if they follow the science and then it's like okay 
and they're saying vaccine safe is in the deal. Okay. But then people are still getting infected. Well, but you have less of a reaction. Okay. I, I can appreciate that. But then they're like, but it's because of non-vaccinated people. <laughs> but I'm like, okay. So I, I don't understand it. So you're telling me I, I, I am fully vaccinated and boosted. And the last week, I also had COVID. So I have so many antibodies running through my system. You know, coronavirus sees me, it like runs in height. Um, but it's like, well, you have to wear a mask because you can still transmit it. How? How? I, I, I don't get it. And they say, like, mask is not from you, to stop you from getting it, from, from you giving it. Uh -huh. I don't think I can get it anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and the, the, rule, the problem is the rules have changed now. so it's many times. And, like, as the days go by, it becomes more of a, like, we have to sell what's left, you know? We can't let this stuff go bad. Like, we've got to unload it. It's, like, it's such a product push to me. And I'm even starting to hear pharmaceutical commercials pushing vaccines. Like, instead of just news people saying, hey, everybody should be vaccinated, you know, or... Joe Biden going out there and making a speech saying everybody should be vaccinated. <clears throat> uh, but the funny thing to well, me is what? they've Are ignored you? the whole total, the entire natural immunity debate. Like, is it better? Is it just as good? Like, we don't talk about those studies enough. Because I think, you know, they, people should have the option of getting the test. And if it says you have the antibodies and you have had it and you want to trust that natural immunity, you should be able to do that. You know, if you've had it, especially if you've had a mild version, because that's like pretty much the whole concept of a vaccine. You give yourself a milder dose and the body comes in and, you know, fights it off <coughs> and, you know, you get your antibodies from that process. And it's a little bit different with the mRNA virus, you know, vaccine, but uh, it's the same concept overall. You know, you, you're introducing a weaker uh version of the virus than you would get in nature, basically. <coughs> and you're, you're kind of tricking your DNA to be able to recognize the next real thing. And supposedly the big thing about the vaccine is it's going to prevent you from getting super sick and dying. But people have died who are vaccinated. So, I mean, there is no guarantee. And that's all like, that's as far as really the, 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 the media that's you know, 24-7 news networks like Fox News will will not necessarily discourage the vaccine, but they won't push it either. You know, so they're getting to that stage where they're saying, well, you know, there are a lot of side effects that people are dealing with, but there are some good stories, you know. And they're still saying that we, it will keep you from getting catastrophic illness. I was working the tree lot last night, you know, and it was pretty, so it was pretty dead. We have some, you know, some artificial and some graveyard stuff that people were still popping in to buy, but not last night. So I was just killed, kicking back, watching TV, make fun of it. So watching that one comedian, um, I was watching, I was watching his uh, podcast show. And it's so entertaining, and he, and he keeps things real, and he tells us about it. And he's like, now, they push the vaccine so much. They have a commercial, and I didn't remember seeing it, and then I didn't saw it last night, where it's a little kid, and he's writing a letter to Santa Claus, and he crosses out toys and stuff like that, and he goes, for God, Christmas this year, all I want is the vaccine. <laughs> and it's like, okay, he goes, and then the comedian was like, first of all, what kid's going to say that? Yeah. You know, there's some kids, like, my, my aunt and her neighbors, like, their kids that are young are like, I just, I just want to get the vaccine because they're afraid, you know, little, they're little kids, you know, they're, they're afraid. And they hear this, and they're like, they want to feel secure, they want to feel protected, and I can appreciate that. Uh, and the crazy thing know? about that is, what did they first tell us when COVID first came on the scene about how kids deal with it? Most of them have no problem with it. Goes right. in and out of their systems like nothing. You know, so 
the fact that they would push a vaccine on children so hard just blows my mind, especially well, one that they I, have I not think, put through the paces like a normal drug would be put through. I think they want to do that. I think they want to do that just because, you know, a kid could get it, and then you, even though they're going to push right through it, they could transmit it to, you know, an adult. Who, so they want to prevent the kids from getting it so that's less possible, you know, transmissions. But as another friend of mine made a great point, is this now, you know, prevalent in animals? Can you vaccinate every animal in the world? <laughs> right. I don't think so. Well, you, you know, know, in China, this was a true story. People were dropping their cats and dogs out, you know, top of buildings, out the window, out of their apartments, because the news went around that pets could get it. Um, and I, I, I thought, you know, because people eat dogs and cats in China that they didn't have them as pets, but <laughs> I had, had to read that article to learn that's not true. They're just like us in some ways. They do have their little cats and dogs, but uh, as soon as it, they realized that a cat and dog could kill them, yep, out the window. Reminds me of a clip from that old movie UHF, where the guy says, "Today we are going to teach poodles oh, how to uh, fly." Yeah, when he was <laughs> poodles. Yeah. 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 It, it was, uh, you know, it was Raul, wasn't it? Yeah. That was a great movie. Teach, and then, then you look down, he has like a whole pile of poodles down there that have been thrown out the window. <laughs> Today. We're going to teach poodles how to fly. I think it was the yeah, same guy that did the Montoya there from uh, Princess Bride. Uh, no, no, different guy. Oh, different the guy, guy that actually played in that movie, um, he he died um, during filming. Oh, no shit. Not, not during the... Or, I mean, the movie was still being filmed because he was actually going to get like another scene or two, but he died in a car accident. Oh, shit. Yeah. I remember reading that. I was like, oh, shit. Because they were saying, like, they wanted to give him another, like I said, another scene or two, but unfortunately he was in a, you know, a tragic car accident and he did not survive. The guy that played Inigo Montoya from um, Princess Bride, he still does, like, another show now, and it's like, like that show will be on, it's like one of the crime shows or something. And I'm like, hey, hey Dad, like, you know who that is? He's like, no, like, my name is Inigo Montoya. He's <laughs> my father. He's prepared to die. <laughs> Oh yeah, he's he's in that um, that uh, psychiatric show there, Criminal Minds. That's what he's in, right? Okay. Yeah. I knew it was something like that. It's super old, in that, but it's funny. Uh, it was good in that. Anyway, uh, getting back to the fight stuff, we also have another fight worth mentioning on uh, Triad Combat 2. The first event saw uh, Kubrat Pulev of uh, Sofia, Bulgaria, pretty pretty much wiping the map with uh, Frank Mir. And uh, Junior Dos Santos is his next opponent. Former UFC heavyweight world champion. And... Uh, that's an interesting matchup. Uh, I don't know if Junior Dos Santos has any better chance than Frank Mir did, though. Um, maybe if it's a first round knockout, he might have a chance. But I think as the fight goes deeper, Junior has a tendency to go into zombie mode. You know, it's uh, it's not, it's, it's not necessarily, like, even a hidden thing. Like, he's actually admitted after fights to not remembering entire rounds of fighting. So, I just, I don't think boxing is going to make that any better for him. Uh, but he has taken a little bit of time off, so sometimes that helps people. Uh, you know, but the thing is, like, you know, once you have that button that gets pushed and... You know, you're in straight-out instinctual mode. That doesn't always go well. You know, the later you get in your career, and, you know, the more damage your brain is taken in those situations, <coughs> I think the more susceptible you are to, you know, bad knockouts. So, Pulev is just fresh off another another knockout in this format, and, uh, you know, he's obviously got a little bit more experience in this particular type of event. And he's going up against 
Dos Santos and more of more of a boxing skill set. The only thing that uh, Dos Santos might have is that grappling capability to, you know, give him a couple of underhooks and, you know, to do the dirty boxing type of stuff, hold the back of his head, you know. But Pulev is going to have some time to train on that, you know, being prepared for for juniors stuff. So I don't know. This could be interesting. Could be a, a, another uh, dominating performance by Pulev, but. He was one of the few boxers to come out on top in that first one. So we also also already talked about Bad Chad Dawson versus Vitor Belfort. And, of course, we're going to uh, have the final matchup between Shannon Briggs and Quentin Rampage Jackson. And I guess they have officially changed Shannon's nickname to Let's Go Champ. <laughs> he says it non-stop I guess they had to do it so quite the interesting match up there anyway I think that's it for us for this week and of course next week will be like the day before New Year's Eve is that going to be safe to do the show that enough time for you, Tony, to get ready to party the next not. day? Yeah, we should nope. be able to do it. All right. So next week we'll have the show. Uh, John Cameron was uh, the victim of COVID lockdowns the other night, according to him. I'm not sure. Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure how much validity that there is to that or if he just fell asleep. But he claims the Internet was out there, so... <laughs> We'll catch up with him next week and uh, try to get that set up. But uh, tonight he was actually forced into working retail. He said, "So I don't know. He's got some some distractions going on, but we're gonna get him and we're gonna talk some Rocky with him. Hopefully next week. And, uh, line that up. I also haven't really had much of a chance to read the book that I bought." of his. It's a pretty thick book, but very big print. And uh, like I said last week, the only thing I don't like is there's no freaking page numbers. I want to be able to tell people next week, well, you know, on page 62, but I don't want to count the pages. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll have to ask him about that next week. Anyway, it's good stuff. It's, you know, a lot of historical information, a lot of good pictures, you know, um, and I actually found something out from reading it that I wasn't aware of before. I might have read it and just forgotten about it, but, you know, there's just some mention in there that I caught offhand reading a page about the reason Rocky developed the crouch in the first place was because the ceiling was low, where he had his first heavy bag hanging up in the basement of his house so he had to crouch so he wouldn't hit his head on the ceiling <laughs> I thought the crouch was just you know just a freak way of fighting that he developed you know because he was awkward but apparently there was some housing issues involved in setting that up but yeah not to be the sec one of the secrets to his success and uh, especially that right hand and he specifically said that, you know, he envisioned himself throwing that, you know, that right hand of the knockout punches, you know, from from that basement setup. <clears throat> anyway, Merry Christmas to everybody, and uh, we hope we... Uh, yep, Merry Christmas, guys. Merry I'm Christmas, great. I'm waking up tomorrow, we're breaking down. Down the rest of the tree lot. I mean, like I said, we're all but done. Like I said, we had one more when I got when I was on my way there yesterday, and I said, "Oh, please let it be gone." My one friend's like, "You better have that shit sold." And I got there. I said, "I didn't even bring my boots tonight." I said, "I ain't leaving the camp." <laughs> and I got there, and they're like, "We sold it a half hour ago." I'm like, "Hallelujah!" Because <laughs> we sold out on December 12th, and they sent me and this other guy, and he's not much of a person that does a lot of work. He's a big, you know, guy, but you know, has some issues um like medical issues yeah so like you're going with him i'm like that means i'm going to do all the work but, like you're picking up another hundred eight footers i'm like oh fucking cock <laughs> um 
And, and then, then they're like, then we sold them out in a couple of days. They're like, oh, we're dropping off another 25. I'm like, you're dropping these ones off though, right? They're like, yeah. And we were blowing through them. So, I mean, I made like a couple grand under the table. Nice little, you know, bonus money. Nice. And, you know, it was good. I got to work with some friends. I'm going to wear my Mike Tyson mirror. Request my shirt tomorrow, <laughs> and I'm cracking the first beer at nine o'clock in the morning. Beautiful. We're breaking down, and, I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'm, I'm cracking some beers open. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to work for a little while. Work the stogie or two. To catch up on the time I lost today at the job, but uh, it's mostly yeah. work for myself because I was supposed to bring home a bunch of wood in the back of the truck, and I didn't even want to go down into the wood pit after getting it out of there. I just wanted to take it home. <laughs> so. Yeah, now I gotta go back to the same lot and hope there's better conditions tomorrow and definitely have the four-wheel drive engaged when I come to that corner. But the, the craziest thing is this guy that the house belongs to, that these people bought it from, I did work for before, and he had an excavator. A bunch of excavators. That's how the wood is all piled up in the backyard, you know. So it blows my mind why he wouldn't put some giant rocks on that corner. To prevent shit like that from happening, you know, he had a machine. He had all the rocks around and stuff. I was like, come on, man. <laughs> I would have rather had a big old dent in my bumper than uh, to have gone through that experience. <clears throat> yeah, it's just bad design. Bad design. Everything's built on a slope in that territory. It's right across the uh, away from the ski resort up here, so it's just another mountain with. With, instead of ski slopes on it, it's houses. And uh, now all of it's by code, like, not allowed. You can't build on those kind of slopes anymore in the town. But all those places are grandfathered. <laughs> so, yeah. I lucked out, though. I tried my luck on a lottery ticket, on a scratch ticket, but uh, did not win. So maybe tomorrow. Maybe it'll... <laughs> you know. <laughs> Translate till tomorrow. So we'll see. All right, guys. Adios for this All week. right, Keith. All right, well, you guys have a good one and enjoy your holiday. Be safe, be merry, be smart, be strong. All right. I made that up. All right, guys. <laughs> Later, guys. Adios. All right, bye.